Well, good morning. It is a joy to be here with you. And uh, as Alan mentioned, I um, send greetings from Grace Community Church, a local church that I attend and I'm a part of. And I'm grateful to serve there as a deacon in the church and uh, serve under four elders, uh, John Street, uh, Tom Patton, Rick McLean, and Bob Houghton. Those are my four elders that give oversight to my life, and it is a joy to also be a part of the council for Greece Advance. And it is a joy to be able to be here with you guys and uh, let you know that uh, with great joy uh, we endeavor to be of help and encouragement to this local body of believers and uh, I do not see myself as Alan's boss, more so I see him as uh, a guy who I wanted to, him to stay for a little bit longer, but he said, no, I want to go into the pastorate. And I said, okay, I'll let you go into the pastorate. And then uh, a few years, I am in the council meeting, and lo and behold, I get this application from a guy named Alan Quinones. And I say to myself, isn't this funny? The guy who wanted to leave now is uh, asking uh, for uh, grace to be a part and a joy to be a part of this local body. So it was with great joy I said, look, I don't know what I need to do. I don't know who I need to pay, but I need to be a part of Alan's life. He can't get rid of me. <laughs> and so uh, if you guys would uh, pray that this uh, joint venture of us coming alongside this local body to be of encouragement, uh, to be of help, um, to bring um, a timely uh, help to you all as you guys establish yourselves. Grace Advance uh, not only takes in um, families and groups of people that want to form a church, and do a church plant, but also sometimes it calls for revitalization where sometimes there are cases where churches are ready to close down and uh, wait a second, don't close it just yet. Let's talk about this. And uh, perhaps we can send somebody to you. And uh, we've seen that on some occasions where the church drastically changes from closing its doors to now thriving and growing and uh, having its niche, if you will, in the community which we're grateful for. Our prayer is that uh, Grace Fellowship would be known for being a sound biblical church and that it would be a healthy church. And you contribute to that. Um, a church is, uh, uh, the, the parts make up the whole. You contribute to this local body. How do you contribute? Your personal relationship to the Lord. Your greatest gift that you could be to this local body is your dedication, your devotion to the Lord Jesus. And in doing so, it will not only transform you the way that you live, obviously, but the way that you um, cause for influence in your family and in the local church. So the greatest gift that you could be to this church body is your own personal holiness, your devotion to Christ. That's how you contribute to this local church, and that's how we grow together. And we're all on this journey together, right? We're not there yet. God has not called us just yet home. But while we have breath, while we have time here on earth, we want to devote it to the Lord. So it is a joy to come alongside this local body. And uh, we'll have more time together in the fellowship meal thereafter. And just like Alan made mention, please stay. And even if you didn't bring, there's, uh, there's always... A uh, prayer that could be made for the multiplication of loaves and fishes, right? Mm -hmm. We'll let Alan pray for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, take your Bible, if you will, and open it to the 119th chapter of the book of Psalms. That's right, Psalm 119. And it is my desire to be back at this church. And so we're not going to do the entire Psalm 119, <laughs> but we will cover verses 17 through 24. Psalm 119. Verses 17 through 24. Listen as I read God's Word, reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. Deal bountifully with your slave, that I may live and keep your word. 
Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. I am a sojourner in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul is crushed with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who stray from your commandments. Take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimonies. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your slave muses on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. May the Lord add blessing to his word. Psalm 119, as you know, is the longest chapter in the Bible with 176 verses. But did you know that it was written with both beauty and poetry. Some call it an alphabetical poem. Why is that? Well, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and under these letters we find eight, that's right, eight one-line verses, each beginning with the Hebrew letter that corresponds to its heading. And today we'll be covering the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Gimel the third letter of the Hebrew alphabet, verses 17 through 24. Each one-line verse beginning with the letter Gimel of the Hebrew alphabet. Yet there is something else that stands out here in Psalm 119. Perhaps the most well-known feature of this psalm is that there are several synonyms given in this psalm for Scripture. Scripture is called the law. The word, the testimony, the precepts, the statutes, the commandments, and the judgments. The reality is that too much cannot be said for the word of God, and the man of God, the woman of God, never tires of extolling the word. I want you to know that here is a man of God who delights in the word of God. How blessed are those who walk in it, who observe it, who treasure it. And so it should be said at the outset that this psalm really is all about affection for the word of God. Affection for the word of God. Affection for the word of God grows in the greatest moments of affliction. Did you catch that? Affection, love for the word of God grows in the greatest moments of affliction of affliction. I mean, where can you turn for comfort and guidance? When you feel the weakest, when you're subdued by the trials of life, even while you're still living in in, in obedience to God, when you're trying to obey God and you're subdued by those hard providences of life, where do you turn to? Where do you turn to for solace? And it's at these moments that we're asking God, please show me what to do. Tell me what the next step is. And so we turn to God. And we turn to his precious word. And that's exactly what the psalmist does here in this psalm. Here is a man who is devoted to live by the word. But as he does, he faces great opposition we find both persecution and prosecution in this psalm. Hostility in opposition. So my prayer is that you will be motivated to be a student of God's word with greater love and affection. Living by the word is not an easy task, let me tell you. But the psalmist provides for us six reminders as to what it will take for a child of God to be living by the word amid tribulation. Six reminders. Let me give it to you at the outset. The first reminder for the child of God to be living by the word amid tribulation is that it calls for mediation. Verses 17 and 18. Mediation. It calls for that. Secondly, it knows alienation. The child of God knows alienation. And we'll discuss what that means in verse 19. Thirdly, it prompts inclination. Verse 20, inclination or devotion, you could say. Fourthly, it awaits intervention. Someone's got to intervene. Verse 21, 
And then it deals with accusation, verse 22. And lastly, the sixth reminder is that it provokes determination in the child of God. Living by the word amid tribulation. Let's begin with the very first one. It calls for mediation, verses 17 and 18. Deal bountifully with your slave. If you have the NAS, with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. The psalmist here begins with a request. Close to 16, 60 times does the psalmist make a petition before God in this one psalm alone. This is not some plea before some pagan, lifeless God, but to the one true and living God. And of this one true and living God, the psalmist pleads, verse 17, deal bountifully. And he prays, open my eyes. There is a dependency on the part of the psalmist here, revealed in these two requests. Mediation is required because the psalmist can't do this on his own. He can't do what he's asking God to do. Only God can do this. He knows this. To deal bountifully at its most basic meaning is to execute, to do, to complete. In other words, do, fulfill only what you alone can fulfill. Deal bountifully with me, O God. In other words, the psalmist is asking God for help. He's asking God for help. And I believe he is in real danger for his life. Why do I say that? Read the latter part of verse 17. Why does the psalmist ask God to deal bountifully with him? Deal bountifully with your slave that I may what? Live. Live. This is not to address the quality or the kind of life, but literally of life as opposed to death. That I may live. The psalmist faces real prosecutors. They are the arrogant in verse 21. They are princes in verse 23. He not only faces real prosecutors, but prosecution. There is reproach. There is contempt. Verse 22. All of this goes on to prove that more was at stake here than merely the kind of life to be lived. At the highest levels, they were talking with one another against the psalmist. His life was in danger. Now, I don't want you to miss the point, so please listen. The reason he is asking God to spare his life, to deal bountifully with him, is so that he may live and do what? Tell me in verse 17. That I may live and what? Keep your word. Keep your word. word. Even in the midst of persecution, he's not asking God to deliver him up to glory, take him away from this life of trouble and the dire circumstances that he is facing. Just bring me home, God. He's not asking God for that. Right out of the gate does the psalmist confront you and I with a question. Why is it that you live? Why is it that I live? My beloved, things become very clear when you're faced with death. Calling tech support, my internet is not working, or what you will be eating for lunch are all things that are chucked out the door. These are mundane things. They don't matter. But what remains is what is most important to you when you are on your deathbed. And here the psalmist asks, for life. And this challenges me and ought to challenge you as well. He's asking for life that he may keep God's word, you see. How convicting is this, my beloved? This man is humble, and we see it by the way he refers to himself as servant, as, as slave. I'm the lowest of low. He is submitting himself to the Lord's sovereign lordship. But there's also a second plea here that the psalmist makes, and that's found in verse 18. What does he ask? Open my eyes. 
Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. This is a prayer for divine illumination. The servant of God needs to understand more fully what God's will and ways are, especially if he's going to be allowed to live in difficult times and difficult days. I need to know what God's word says, what his will and ways are. I mean, how else can a young man keep his way pure? Only by keeping it according to God's word, right? Verse 9 of this Psalm 119. Divine illumination is needed so that he may behold, literally, fix my gaze upon wonderful things from your law. This requires some learning. Learning about God's word. This requires some thinking, thinking about God's word. This entails musing, delighting in God's word. All with a view to put God's word into practice. We're not only to be a storehouse of truth, we are to be a conduit of the truth by what we speak, what we say, and how we live. We need to be putting God's word into practice. And that's why the psalmist asks, teach me, teach me. Look at verse 12, go back to verse 12. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, teach me your statutes. Look down at verse 26. I have recounted my ways and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. And then look down at verse 33. Instruct me, O Yahweh, in the way of your statutes, that I may observe it to the end. Instruct me. Teach me. This man is humble. He's in the posture of a student. He is a student in the school of Christ, if you will. Statute speaks of the binding force and the permanence of Scripture as if laws engraved or inscribed. Just as the Lord instructed Isaiah in Isaiah 30, verse 8, when the Lord tells Isaiah, go, write it on a tablet before them, and inscribe it on a scroll, that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. As a witness forever. My beloved, we ask God to teach us that it may serve not only for ourselves in this time and place, but that it may be a witness to the generation yet unborn. The word of God is binding upon our conscience. It is permanent. It does not change. It is to be inscribed on our hearts. On our hearts. And here the law of God connects life and obedience. I want to be taught the word of God that I may obey. So many times in the book of Proverbs when a father is teaching his children, he's telling them, listen, listen to what I'm saying to you. I want you to listen so that you will obey my words. That's why I want you to listen. Listen to the words that I'm saying that you may obey. It's the same here, connecting life and obedience. I want to be taught, I want to learn that I may obey. Is this not your heart's desire as well, my beloved? Going back to verse 18, it all begins with this prayer. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. My beloved, without divine teaching, without divine illumination... This book right here remains a sealed book. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what to him? Foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 
It is the Spirit of God in the transformed heart of man that provides him with a capacity to not only discern divine truth, but as the psalmist puts it, to behold, to see wonderful things from your law. Only the true believer, the genuine believer, sees beauty when he opens God's word. The beauty of what God has to say. Oh, that this would be our prayer every time we come as God's gathered people on the Lord's day. Whenever you gather together for the purpose of studying, to be in the posture of a student, may you be asking that question. May you be praying this. God, open my eyes. Open my eyes. Some of you need coffee in the morning. I get that. I feel your pain. I feel it. But this is a spiritual prayer. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Now I know that our life is not filled with the study and meditation and learning of God's word 24-7. We do have work. We do face traffic. We have little ones to take care of. We have grandchildren to call upon. We have games to attend. All those things are a part of life. I get that. But that does not take away from our desire to know God and His ways. Especially because of the fallen world we live in and how out of place we are in this world. And that is why we pray, open our eyes, Lord. Extend our days that we may live and keep your word amidst this perverse generation, Philippians 2.15 tells us, whom we are to be to appear as lights in the world, Paul says to the church at Philippi. And so we pray for mediation. But there's also a second reminder that the psalmist provides, and that is that living by the word amidst tribulation means that the child of God knows a thing or two about alienation. That's right, alienation. Verse 19, I am a sojourner, or in some translations, I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. Stranger, sojourner refers to a temporary dweller, newcomer with no inherited rights. It is used of Abraham at Hebron in Genesis 23, 4. It's used of Moses when he was in the desert, Exodus 2, 22. It's used of Israel in Egypt in Genesis 15, 13. And David in Psalm 39, verse 13, where he says, I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Even David felt like this. As a stranger, he does not enjoy the full rights of a citizen. He possesses no land. Such a one is usually marked by poverty or numbered among the economically weak who, like widows and orphans, can lay claim to aid. This is a strange land to the psalmist. He feels out of place, you see. Others are slandering him in verses 22 and 23, and the powerful are against him in verse 23. Anyone in his shoes would feel the same way. What is noteworthy in the psalmist is his dedication to God's commandment. All the while. He may not have full citizenry. He may not possess any land. And that's no concern to the psalmist. Rather, what is his concern? What is his prayer? His prayer is, do not hide your commandments from me. Do not hide your commandments from me. That is to say, do not hide the understanding of your commandments. It's a, it's a prayer for continued revelation and illumination of God's word. He needs divine enabling to guide him through this strange land that he is in. For many years, I felt neither a part of the U.S. nor a part of my homeland, El Salvador. Even having become a citizen of this great land of the free and home of the land. brave. <laughs> I am reminded that this is not my home. 
it isn't. I have felt much like the psalmist here, a stranger, most of my life. And it has been a reminder to me that this is not my home, even though I have a love for this country, even though I possess a great thankfulness to God for bringing me here at a young age. I realize, I have come to realize as a believer that this nation is under God's judgment, you see. God's judgment. That's why I've come to study the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a man who ministered for over 40 years. He began his ministry when things were looking good for Judah all the way until the exile of Jerusalem. He was there throughout the whole time. He lived a hard life filled with hard providences. He was rejected by his own people and he was even threatened by them. And yet all along he was faithful to the Lord, you see. He was faithful to the Lord to give God's word to God's people. Not what they wanted to hear, but what they what? Needed to hear. His life was one long martyrdom. How lost would he would he have been if it were not for God's word? Early on, when he was called to serve the Lord in full-time ministry in Jeremiah 1.19, we read these words. They, that is referring to the kings and princes and people of his day, they will fight against you, but they will not overcome you. God says this to Jeremiah. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Does that sound familiar to you? Same promise that he has given to all believers. I will not forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans. Even to the end of the age, I will be with you. That's what you need. The promises of God to hang on to. Especially in dire circumstances. Can you imagine living in a place where high authority... Those in high authority and uh, your own people fight against you? Your own countrymen fighting against you? What would you do without God's word? Let this be a sober reminder to us all that this is not our home. And we, like the saints of old, desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Hebrews eleven sixteen tells us. Yet no matter what you face in life, despite how much of a stranger you may feel walking around this land, this is not your home. I understand you have a love for Florida. You have a disdain for California. I get it. But this too is not your home. I mean, you enjoy four good months of weather. And then the other months, not so. Let me remind each one of us that we are to live for Him. We are to live for God. We are to follow His commandments. And each time you come to God's Word, remember that His commandments remind you of home. Remind you of home. Listen to Spurgeon as he writes, While we wander here, We can endure all of the ills of this foreign land with patience if the word of God is applied to our hearts by the Spirit of God. But, he says, if the heavenly things which make for our peace were hid from our eyes, we should be in an evil case. In fact, we should be at sea without a compass, in a desert without a guide, in an enemy's country without a friend. End quote. That's what would life be like were it without God's word. Living by the word of God amid tribulation not only calls for mediation, knows a thing or two about alienation, but thirdly prompts inclination or devotion. And that's exactly what you see in verse 20. My soul is crushed with longing. My soul is crushed with longing. Interesting way to put it. The leading verb here means to crush in pieces. One commentator translates 
this way. I am practically shattered by the intensity of my longing. Now put soul to this verb, next to this verb, and you're metaphorically making reference to being worn down, being consumed in languish. It's a powerful word picture that he is using to assert that he is perpetually being consumed with a deep desire for the word. Here it is called your ordinances. Or as the Legacy Standard Bible or King James Version or New King James Version, judgments. Judgments, ordinances. The word judgment is a legal term. It describes a judge's statement of what should have taken place in a particular case. In other words, God's words, God's word describes God's statement about what ought to occur uh, as to what is right. What ought to occur in this situation or that? What is right? And God's word tells us what is right. This was a problem for those who worship pagan gods. There was always a lack of assurance as to what the gods demanded of their worshipers. Pagan gods were notoriously changeable and could manipulate, trick, and overpower one another. You could have one god rule one day and another god another day. You could not keep up with their demands. Pagan gods were also notorious for having Twisted moral standards. In this, they were much like humans, not so like gods. No way. Pagan gods would lie, cheat, steal, and be sexually promiscuous. Such, sure, they were portrayed as being powerful and seemingly live forever, but you could never trust their judgments. <coughs> not so with God. The one true living God. God, on the other hand, is to be trusted always. Psalm 19, verse 9. The judgments of the Lord, the judgments of Yahweh are true. True. My beloved, this is absolutely assuring. I love this. God's word is true. This echoes what Paul writes in Romans 3, 4. Let God be found true, though every man be found a what? A liar. a liar. I love that God is a judge whose judgments are right. His judgments are true. And that what we read in Scripture is absolutely the truth and thus reliable. It is no wonder that the psalmist inclines his soul and devotes his soul at all times to God's ordinances. But do you see the progression that's happening here with regards to God's word? In verse 17, if I'm allowed to live, I will spend my days in keeping God's word. And then in verses 18 and 19, if I'm going to keep God's word, I must understand what it says. And so I pray, open my eyes, do not hide your commandments from me. And then here in verse 20, if I'm going to understand your word, there has to be a passion in my soul burning within me after God's word. Lest we forget that this passion comes from a shattering of the soul, a languish in the soul of being worn down. Now I might ask you again, what is creating this for the psalmist? What is creating this? You know what's creating this language of the soul for God's word? It's his trial. It's the persecution he's facing. My beloved, isn't this the case that when we go through hard times, we too experience this longing for God and for his truth? He is the only thing that makes sense his truth is the only thing that makes sense. Lest we forget that we live in a pagan culture where they don't get it right. They are on the wrong side of God's truth. They make bad judgments. 
Nevertheless, God's judgments are right all the time. Amen? Amen. You're with me. That's good. Fourth reminder, living by the word amid tribulation, the child of God awaits intervention. That's right, intervention. Verse 21, let's see who that is. You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander from your commandments. Stop right there. This statement couldn't have come at a better time. It's a great reminder to us all that as we live by the word of God, as we are obedient to what God's word says, we all await God to intervene. The more the psalmist is emboldened by the word of God, the more he is at odds with the world. The more he has something to say about that time and place that he lives in. You just can't keep quiet, you see. A Christian doesn't keep quiet. He must proclaim the excellencies of him who has delivered him from darkness and the light. And anyone who has been saved has to speak concerning Christ and what he has done. Has to speak concerning God's word. You can't keep quiet. Here the psalmist uses a word that only appears 14 times in the entire Old Testament. The root of the word is rebuke. And it indicates a check applied to a person or people through strong admonitions or actions. Here it's used of God. Elsewhere the object of his rebuke has been the nations, Psalm 9.6. It's been, it's been even Satan in Zechariah 3.2. Here two people groups are identified one through an adjective that's describing a noun, the arrogant ones, and the other are through a participle, cursed are they. The former, that is the adjective, the arrogant ones, the insolent ones who assume that they do not have to follow God's laws. That's who they are. They arrogantly mock those who follow God's instructions and attempt to take away the rights of the godly by violent acts. Does that sound familiar to you? The latter, that is the participle, cursed are they, describes their state. They are cursed of God who wander from his commandments. They want nothing to do with God, you see. They despise God, then they treat all that reflects his divine cause and character with contempt. With contempt. The reminder to us all is that God is the ultimate and only avenger. He will rebuke them. But the psalmist must wait on God to intervene. That's why the appropriate question isn't why, oh why, oh God. The appropriate question in Scripture is, how long? How long, O oh Lord? How long? And intervene he will. Is this not so? We know how it finishes, right? Mm -hmm. He wins at the end. Amen. We just lose in the present. And we have to be okay with that. He will intervene. But in his good timing, not ours. At a time when there was no end in sight, the psalmist would say as he did in Psalm 74.10, How long, O God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name forever? How long? That's the appropriate question to ask. You may not ever get a why. You will get an answer as to how long it will be. It may not come in your lifetime, but it will come. It will come. Later we see the struggle that he carries in verses 84 through on, actually. If you turn over to 84, how many are the days of your servant? Ever ask yourself that question? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? Verse 85, the arrogant have dug, dips, dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. All your commandments are faithful. They have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. Verse 87, they almost destroyed me on earth, but as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. Verse 88, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Revive me. 
Perhaps that's what needs to be our prayer. Revive us according to your loving kindness so that I may and you may keep the testimony of God's mouth. Yet there's more. Notice the fifth reminder, living by the word amid tribulation deals with accusation. It's coming, folks. Verse 22, take away reproach and contempt from me, for I observe your testimony. Stop right there. We enter into the struggle the psalmist faces, you see. Thus far, it has been talk of the land and how much of a stranger that you and I may feel in that land. But here lies the core of his problems. And so he prays, take away reproach and contempt from me. Both reproach and contempt speak of the derisive attitude of the wicked toward the righteous. And so he prays, take them away, take them away. He is the recipient of verbal attacks. He is a recipient of slander, of arrogant men maligning his character, all because of his obedience to God and to his word, you see. What a sober reminder to us all that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be what? Finish it. Persecuted. Second Timothy 3.12. And yet the reminder Paul gives to young Timothy is the same reminder coming from the testimony of the psalmist in this psalm. As we read earlier, as your pastor read earlier, 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 17. How appropriate that you read that. Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the what? The sacred writings, the holy scripture, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Scripture gets you off the wrong path and leads you on the right path. Notice the emphasis upon the word of God amid persecution, my beloved, in dealing with arrogant, evil men and postures who will proceed from bad to worse. Notice that. My beloved, we are limited in our circumstances. We do not control the response or the attitude of this land toward God and his law. You need to realize that. Yet we know some will wander from his commandments. Some will bring persecution on those who stand firm in God's ways and to his will. Yet we do not take matters into our own hands. Here the psalmist says, God, you rebuke them. Verse 21. He makes an appeal that reproach and contempt be removed from him. But there is no promise that God will do so. He may have a divine purpose and a will for his good pleasure and for our good and to establish good. And that's all up to God. We can pray, but God is sovereign, right? The reminder to us all is that God is God and I'm not him. I'm not in control. God is in control. I submit to the fact that he's in control. I obey what he says in his word. But I leave the results up to God. I leave it all to the Lord. I entrust it all to Him. We are but His servants. We are but His slaves. He is our master. We are His slaves. He is our king. We are His subjects. Oh, but we... He is our father and we are His children. Amen to that, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. Rather, the psalmist understands his parts, and so he says, verse 22, what is your part? Verse 22, for I, what? I observe your testimonies. My beloved, this is where we live and breathe in the midst of persecution. What is your role? What is God's will for my life in the midst of trials and tribulations and persecutions? What am I to do? I observe. (laughs) I observe. That's where I live and breathe. That's me. I observe your testimonies. We observe his testimonies. It is our task to guard, to keep, to follow his word and commandments. That's 
our duty. That's our obligation. That's our joy. Lastly, the sixth and last reminder, we already mentioned mediation, alienation, inclination or devotion, intervention, accusation, and now determination. In verses 23 through 24, it engenders this determination in the soul, verses 23 and 24. Even though princes sit and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counselors. Whatever he faces, regardless of what he faces from arrogant men, even men in the highest positions of the land, His duty, his task, what he's going to be given to is to meditate on God's statutes. Notice the word princes. If you have the ESV, King James or New King James, princes. The term was used to speak of a commander of the army, a high functionary, a governor, or even a prince. Whatever their specific identity, we're talking about those officials who have natural power. They have the power to turn such power, not only to turn against the psalmist, but also to conspire against him. Do you not think that that's what evil men do? Conspire against you? You who live for God? You who love God? You who obey God? They deliberately talk with one another. They convene. They have a powwow. You're not invited. And they talk about what they're going to do. Do you not think that there is an agenda at play here? This is not conspiracy theory here, folks. This is what the psalmist faced back in his day, and this is still what the believer faces today. No matter their plan or what they plan to do to me, the psalmist resolves in his own heart with determination what he will do. Meditate on your statutes. He will muse on his statutes. For to him they have become his delight, his counselors. You see, the word of God means everything to me. Who am I to obey, man or God's word? God's word. My beloved, how important is the word of God amid tribulation, amid persecution? Though this portion of the psalm walks through the experience of the psalmist, it's really true for us all here today. Amid all that he faces, the psalmist turns to God and turns to his word in which he delights and looks for counsel. His plea before God is that he will extend his days on earth, that he may keep his word, that he may grow to understand what God's will and God's ways are. So when you face reproach and contempt from the world, my beloved, find comfort and counsel as you learn to live by his word. Dedicate yourself anew to the study of his word, to meditate upon it, and watch your affection grow anew for his commandments. My prayer for you all is that you may grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus as we face whatever lies ahead. You're not alone. We know that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. world. 1 John 4.4 4. When many deserted our Lord and joined the scoffers, our Lord turned to his own and asked this penetrating question in John 6, verse 67. Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go also, do you? Simon Peter, this was his good day. <laughs> Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. You too won't go, will you? You'll stick around. You'll stay faithful. 
by God's enabling. You will grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus as you come together as a body of Christ, as you glean from God's word, as a faithful shepherd will lead you and teach you his commandments, and you will listen. Listen carefully so that you will put it into practice in your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we never be ashamed of your word, of you. May we never displease you by unholy or imprudent conduct. May we never make the multitude our model, but make you our model. Help us to love as you have loved us so richly, so lavishly. And whatever we do, may it be done in the Savior's name. For to him we live, we walk in love. For your name's sake we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.